A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Assalamu alaykum. Okay, give me a little more energy. This is a greeting of Jannah. Assalamu alaykum. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. I want to thank uh, Isaac here <coughs> as well as like media for extending the opportunity for me to come and share some ideas <coughs> about taking stock of ourselves, more specifically taking stock of our good deeds and our bad deeds. And I want to say at the outset that if you don't get anything else from what I'm about to say, you can at least amuse yourself with my United States Southern accent. Uh, Brother Otto was saying about his Birmingham accent, well, you haven't heard anything till you hear a Southerner like myself uh, try to address a crowd. So if nothing else, just go on and amuse yourself. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, uh, I want to talk briefly about a very serious subject, but I want us also to enjoy ourselves. Uh, we are not having a session where we're pulling teeth without anesthesia. Uh, this is a session when we would want to try to learn as much as we possibly can. And to facilitate that process, I want to kind of abbreviate some of the things that I may have said, uh, but given the setting that we're in and how we're set up, and I apologize for even sitting here, I would be sitting on this, but I had some back surgery a few months ago, and so this is why I pray in the chair, and, and I'm sitting in this chair uh, like I am today. I don't want to have myself up above anyone else, but it's just a, the condition that I'm in right now. So I will abbreviate most of my comments so that we can have more time for direct interaction. Let's have an interactive discussion as opposed to my just lecturing to you. As I said, the, the topic of the discussion this evening is taking stock analyzing our good deeds and our bad deeds. And I want to start this discussion by uh, narrating parts of the Hadith of Jibril, alayhi salam, as is commonly known. And you all know this Hadith better than I. And I'm not going to recite it in detail. I just want to reference portions of it. And I want to reference the portions of this Hadith well, you're familiar how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sitting in a group of his Sahaba and they were discussing Deen. And all of a sudden, this man walked up with this pristine white garb on without showing any signs of perspiration or dirt anywhere on his body. And he walked into the middle of the session and as the Hadith relates, he sat right in front of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and was so close to him that his knees were touching the Messenger of Allah وسلم. And this man began to ask the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about the deen. And much of the commentary about this Hadith of Jibril, as it is called, is for Jibril وسلم, not to question the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as if he didn't know the answer. But it was giving a summarized version. It was summarizing the intent and the purpose of Islam and the mission itself of Islam under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad So the angel Jibril asked the Prophet Muhammad to tell me about Islam, tell me about Iman. And he went through a series, series of things. Tell me about the Akira, tell me about Qadr. But I want to just focus at this beginning. When the question was raised, well, tell me about Isan. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in responding to all of the questions, he responded to the angel Jibril that Isan as is, it is as if you're worshiping Allah and you can see Allah as you worship him. And he said that if you can't get to that state of consciousness. If you can't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And this is the highest level of Iman that we could have as human beings. 
And it's not just trying to configure in our mind's eye what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may look like or how he's looking at us or any of these things. But it's the consciousness of knowing and establishing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which everything that we do, we are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of that which we're doing. That there's nothing, there's no place, there's no thought that we might utter. That when we worship Allah in this state of isan, that there's nothing that we could possibly even think about in our own consciousness, knowing vividly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not know the things that we're doing. And I submit for the purpose of this discussion that if you and I are to build upon our good deeds, a very good starting point is to live our lives as best as we can in the state of Isan, to try to do everything that we do. When you come to this university, when you come to a session like this, when you go home to your family, when you interact with people in the community, when you donate to causes like you just have donated so graciously here this evening, when you understand that the least of us, how we treated the person who had the greatest need, how we sought out the needs of the people, not just wait for someone to come to us and tell us that they are in need, that all of these things have done with the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being aware of even the intent behind whatever it is that we do, then that state of consciousness will even like, for an example tonight, that your, if what you have done is feasibility then inshallah, if Allah gives that barakah to you, then this will constitute a good deed. It's more and will be multiplied uh, many times. So the idea that as you and I go through our daily activities, that what we will do is try to elevate this consciousness to the level of Allah consciousness and everything. Now, let me give you a practical example of the flip side of what I'm talking about. A practical example of this is <clears throat> in the community from which I'm a part in North Carolina. Uh, there was a, a, a Pakistani sister, and there was an African-American convert brother. And they met in university. And this convert had converted to Islam for about four years. And he had occasionally come to the mosque because the university was not in the same city of the mosque in which I, that I go to. And he had come a number of times to the mosque and I just felt, and I used to tell the other brothers, that's a very good young man. The, bro the brother is very uh, conscious about his responsibilities and his duties. He's a real good person. I didn't know that there had been a friendship that had developed between this brother and this single sister who was going to the university where he was. Now, he was graduating as an electrical engineer. And the sister had just transferred from a community college, and I've forgotten what she was studying when she transferred over to, to the university that he was attending. But he was uh, a well-sought-after commodity in the job market, the, the, the engineering firms, he just had so many stacks, literally, of offers for him to work. Everyone spoke highly of him. But then <clears throat> when this sister and this brother decided that perhaps they would like to, for her to talk to her father, because he's, of course, is her natural wali. And she talked to her father and said, you know, dad, I really think I may be interested in marrying this young man. And the father listened to all of the things that I've said, his credentials and his family status and all of these things. But then something funny happened along the way. Is a timer on the lights? Oh, okay. So we got to move to keep the lights going. I got you. Okay. We'll jump around a little bit here to keep the lights going. And, but there, there was something funny that happened along the way. 
And what happened along the way was that the dad said, invite the young man over to the house for dinner. I'm not working this Sunday, Sunday my business will be closed, so come, have him come over to the house. When the young man came over to the house, the young sister told me that my dad literally opened the door, looked at this young man, and slammed the door in his face and walked away from the front door. And so she said, well, Dad, you know, this is the brother that I'm talking to you about. So he reluctantly let him into the house. They had dinner. And immediately after having that dinner, that father locked, literally locked his daughter in her room, took all of her electronics, took computer, took um, everything. I mean, iPhone, iPad, you name it, anything, any means of communication. He took it from her. He kept her in this state for two weeks. She was not able to even attend classes. And so one of her friends, a non-Muslim friend, became very wary about her because she would call on the home phone and the dad would just say, well, she's not here. And he would instruct other members of the family to say the same thing. So finally, and I'll make this short, but finally, uh, I've already drawn on for a long time, but I'll make it shorter at the end. Then finally, the young girl was so concerned that she called the police. And the police came to the house and they knocked on the door. The dad let them in. They asked about the girl. And this non-Muslim was with the police. He opened the door. The girl came out crying, saying that she was being held prisoner in her own house. She was not 15 or 16. She was about 20, 21 years old. I'm being held a prisoner in my house. I haven't been able to communicate. Uh, he's had uh, these boards put on my bedroom window so nobody can see. I can't see out. I can't get out. I can't go out of the window. The police escorted her out of the house. So there are a lot of different dy dynamics in this particular scenario. First with the girl, first with the young man, and especially with the father. But if, and I, I'm not trying to judge, I'm not judging, I'm just trying to convey uh, real occurrences and give us an opportunity to see in a practical kind of way that without taking, without having taqwa, taqwa, without having taqwa law and having a state of isan, a consciousness about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing everything that we do, then you and I on any given occasion are capable of doing some very unjustifiable acts. Doing things that while we're in the masjid, while you're here in this prayer room, and you come here on a regular basis, that if that level of God-fearing heart is not there, you can very easily and quickly do something that is so despicable in the eyes of the believers, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can so easily slip, so quickly we can slip and do something. And then let me tell you the quick end of the story. Uh, the, the young lady and the young man, after she was let out of the house, uh, she went back and I think she got a dorm room uh, on the campus and she was living on the campus. The young man was graduating very shortly uh, and they kind of just disappeared. Didn't hear anything else about them. The next thing that I hear is from an imam friend of mine in another city and he said that the young man had referenced you, talking about me, and said that I could tell him uh, a little about his situation and why, why they were trying to get married in that city and not in the city where he would frequently attend the mosque. And so I told the imam what I knew about the young man. I told him uh, certain things about the whole situation. But I'm glad to relate that now they have been married for two years. They have about an eight month old baby. And to the credit of this dad, that once that baby came into existence, then all of that almost hatred that he showed for the young man, now her husband, all bets were off. Now he had a grandson 
And the only way that he was going to interact with his grandchild was to act civil and act in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was some care, there was some good to come out of the situation. But in the meantime, look at the level of bad dawah that occurred on that campus when that young girl was saying that I had to leave my own home because my dad resented who I was marrying just that much, that I was locked into my room. That these are the kinds of stories, oftentimes, that never get public, but they're things that may go on in our personal lives. And one of the responsibilities that we all have is, to, of course, to just take a stand for what is just and what is correct. Okay. Now, I want to uh, shift gears just a little bit and talk about another story, this one from the pages of the Islamic history. And I want to turn those pages back to a time of the Prophet Muhammad and look at some of the events that took place under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad and how they understood this process of how do I gather good deeds? How do I know what deeds are good? And how they may be beneficial for me in the Akira, uh, how they may be detrimental to me and be something that I will be punished for because the accumulation of these deeds and not, and I'll not seeking Tauba for these deeds. A couple of different things. One is a story that you know the story better than I. It's the story about a man who was a rather wealthy Sahabi. That this was a man who, by his own words, after the event that I'll sort of gla uh, glance over, that he was a man that, at the approach of this event, he said himself that I had never been wealthier in my entire life. He was a young man. He had never said, he said, I never felt stronger than I did at this particular time. And this is a story that we can take from directly off the pages of Sahih Bukhari. And it's the story as narrated by Qa'ab ibn Malik. Qa'ab ibn Malik, as you know, was the Sahaba that at the call for all able-bodied men from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to come together to outfit themselves in a way that they could be able to go on this long, long journey across the Arabian desert to go to a most distant place where they were about to meet the Roman troops and to engage and to fight with the mighty Roman army. So Cobb ibn Malik said that as he saw people preparing every day, he realized then that I, again, I've never had more money. If I want to equip a number of people, I can do this. That he was young and he was strong. He said, I've never felt stronger than I did at that moment. But Cobb procrastinated. And what Cobb allowed to happen was the days to leave. He said that the, it was the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, so that the enemy would not know what the Muslims were planning, that the Prophet وسلم, would wait to the very last minute to even tell the brothers, this is where we're going. He would wait to the very last minute to even say the exact time where we're going. He didn't want the intelligence of the Quraysh to be able to get this information and prepare for many of the surprise attacks that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led under his leadership. But Cobb said on this occasion, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam acted very differently. And he told us a long time in advance. And everyone began to prepare. They began to outfit. He talked about how there were some who could not afford to prepare or to go on this journey. And they were crying, they were weeping, because they would not be able to respond to this particular ca uh, call. But Cobb said it was different for him. He said, I saw the people preparing. And I said, well, I have time. 
I, I'll, I'll wait. I don't have to scrape up any money. I have time. So he saw the people leave, uh, preparing. He said he didn't do anything about it. He said he actually saw the, the Mujahideen leaving out of Medina. And somehow he had it in his head, well, I'll catch up. I don't even have to go out there with him. And then finally, when he decided that I am going to join this force under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Cobb ended up saying he realized that they were so far uh, away from Medina that it would have been impossible for him to catch. And so we know that there were three very good believers left behind, who stayed behind in Medina. And the Cobb said that the only other people outside of these two other believing, sincere brothers were the Munafikun, nothing but hypocrites. So he said that when the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and, and the Mujahideen start coming back into Medina, that people were going to each other and saying, now what can we tell Muhammad Wasallam so that he won't be angry with us? So say the hypocrites lined up and one by one, came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu telling lies, giving excuses. And Cobb reflected, as is related in this narration, that if, if he were inclined to tell a lie, he said, I could have been the best of them. But he said that there was something in his heart that would not allow him to go and lie to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu regardless of the consequences. So when these hypocrites kept coming and giving the lie, Cobb said, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just said, Allahu Akbar. Allah knows best. Okay, just move on. Just, just go on about your business, move on. But then when it was Cobb's turn to relate his reason for not going on this expedition, the Hadith literature tells us that Cobb said, O Messenger of Allah, there's no excuse. I just didn't do. I was harvesting dates. I had no reason to leave myself behind like that. I'm not going to tell you a lot. There's no possible reason that I could give. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu just kind of dismissed Cobb and said, well, Allah will decide your fate. And to shorten this rather long hadith, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in incremental stages increased the severity of the public penalty for Cobb and these three people. And the severity of the penalty, this penalty lasted for 50 days. And for 50 nights, this penalty was in effect. And how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam executed the penalty of, on these believers. Now just picture for a moment, the hypocrites, the liars, are telling lies. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu knows that they're lying because Allah revealed to him that they're liars. But there was nothing done to all of those hypocrites who lied and stayed behind. But to those three believers, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu incrementally said, okay, I don't want any of the brothers, any of the sisters to say anything to them. Don't look at them if you don't have to. Don't have conversation with them, just act as if they don't exist. Cobb said that the other two were older than him, the true believers. They were older. He said, but I was a young man, so the shame that I felt was great, but still, Cobb said, I would go to Salah every day, and I would sit as close as I could to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to try to see if he's just going to look my way and I would see him looking at me, and when I looked in his direction, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would just turn his head away. He said, I would go to my relatives, and I would try to have conversation with them, and they just ignored me. They were following this, ostrac this being ostracized with God to the letter. Then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed the wives of the brothers to separate from them. One was an elder man, or an older guy, he needed his wife's assistance. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave, uh, gave permission for his wife to remain with him. Cobb, in his own words, and I'll conclude with this uh, part of this, this, this story. 
in Cobb's own words. He said that it felt like the world was closing in on him. He felt the worst pain that he ever could have imagined. And but what happened? Cobb said that one day <clears throat> he was in his house and he thought he heard someone calling his name. And Cobb said that I kept hearing, Assalamu alaikum, Cobb, Cobb, Cobb. He said, I thought I was dreaming. But then he came out and he saw his cousin. And he asked his cousin, are you talking to me? I mean, you, re you referring to me? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to you, Cobb. And he said that the boycott has been lifted on you. That, that uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has instructed for people now can talk to you and uh, everything can go back to normal. But before Cobb rejoiced, Cobb's fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was such that he asked this, his cousin, is this from Allah or is this from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because Cobb knew that if it was just from the softness of the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet may be overruled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before he could get happy, he just said, is this from Allah? Is this from the Prophet? And when, he, uh, when the cousin told him, well, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Cobb said that it was the best moment of his life. He couldn't have felt better under any circumstances than how he felt at this moment when this boycott was lifted. Cobb said that from that day forward, I vowed that I would never, ever play with the truth in any kind of way, no matter what the consequences and the rest of his life story, as related by Sahaba, it talks about how he was the most honest person in this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But this, my brothers and sisters, came from a state of living in Asan, conscious of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and having this special relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The example that it shows, Allahu Alam, is that even brothers, even sisters, who through their faith and their work can attain this degree of, of relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you won't exercise bad judgment at time. It doesn't mean that acts that you may commit would not go into your book of deeds as bad deeds. But what it shows to all of us is that if a person like Cobb, and he's described so wonderfully in the Syria literature and describing his emotions in this long hadith, that if a person like Cobb can make such a grievous mistake, and it was grievous, because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is calling all of the able-bodied Muslim men to make whatever sacrifice you need to make to leave Medina to go on the longest expedition that they would ever uh, embark upon under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to transverse this Arabian desert and withstand the harshness of it, to borrow money, to cry and to beg and just all of these things. And so Cobb Ibn Malik, to me, for so many years, I mean, it's almost every time I read the, about Cobb, every time I say anything about him, my, my eyes start getting a little tearful because it's the kind of person by way of being conscious of your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I could have just lied to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and been just like those other hypocrites. Nothing would have happened to me. Long line of them, everybody lying, except for Cobb and the other two brothers. So brothers and sisters, compiling good deeds First, as we know from the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, we know that these good deeds and piling them up starts with niyyah, that every deed has to be, be preceded by intention. And 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us. And I'm not telling you something you don't know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us. Got to, got to move a little bit here to get the lights to stay on. There you go. There you go. Alhamdulillah. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us. That he gives us these opportunities to just pile up good deeds. Just make your deeds, everything you do during the course of a day, feasibility. I'm doing this for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some little small act like 100 pounds to the people in the uh, affected areas of the Philippines. That no matter what it is that you and I do, just by having the intention that I'm doing this for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. I'm not trying to show off. I'm not trying to make people think I'm something other than I am. I am doing this out of the pleasure of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that our deeds are multiplied. So many times we can't count the times that these good deeds are multiplied simply by having the proper niyah. Just seek the pleasure of Allah and Allah will multiply the good deeds. Allah is so merciful, and you know this better than me. Allah is so merciful that when we con uh, commit sins against our souls, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only counts it one time. There's no multiplication of our bad deeds. It's registered as one bad deed. And this is the real kicker. One of my daughters, um, she, when she was growing up, and we used to talk to her and tell her hadith and read her different things. She had a hard time understanding this. I don't know what it is. Maybe she's slow like her father. But she had a hard time understanding this concept. And that is the concept of how merciful Allah is to us by way of this example. That if you and I intend to do a good deed, and for some reason, we aren't able to carry that good deed out. But our intention, true intention, was to do the good deed. Allah will give us the reward of having that good intention. And this is where it really got tricky with my daughter. And Allah is so merciful and given us so many opportunities not to stain up our soul and to load our book of deeds up with all of these bad deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we intend to do wrong, we intend to do something bad, but then we stop from doing it out of re being reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't do it, then it's recorded as a good deed. Now that's one that my daughter had a hard time getting to. She couldn't quite understand. You mean if I intend to do this, and something happens and I don't do this, that it's not counted as a bad deed. But the tricky part for us is that we don't do it because of the dhikr law. We remind, we're praising Allah. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we stop from doing something that's bad and then it's counted as a good deed. So I can't overemphasize. And there are many, many examples that we can give of how this process of getting good deeds and this process of even taking bad deeds off of our record, it can't be uh, overemphasized. Now, I want to uh, share just one other thing and, um, and I'll be done. Well, I'm not gonna say one other thing, just a couple of the quick things. <coughs> a number of years ago, there was a very dear Sheikh that lived in New York City. He was from the Gambia. And his name was Al Fahim Job. And Al Fahim Job was one of the most beloved sheikhs in New York City. He was the kind of person that just being around him, it just, your heart just felt so close to Allah, just being in his presence, just listening to him relate Quran, just to talk about different things about the Sahaba. It just warmed your heart. He had such a wonderful, attractive personality. 
that people from all over the tri-state area in New York and Connecticut and whatever the other tri-state is there around New York City. Huh? Yeah, New Jersey, thank you. Yeah, you over here in Oxford and I'm living in the United States and I can't even remember. Okay, <laughs> okay, so you, you're taking the good deed from the sister. Okay, alhamdulillah, she'll get her good deed as well. But in the tri-state area, young people like yourself would travel to his classes. They would just pour into this masjid. And it got, he get, became so popular that a larger site had to be held for his classes. And he did a number of them during the week. But one of his most popular classes with young people was on Sunday nights. And so they had to find a larger place because all these young people would come to listen to Al Fahim. And I had the opportunity to be on a national shura with him. And I just loved just being around him. I couldn't get enough of being around this particular brother. He was a wonderful speaker as well. And Al Fahim was on his way to a uh, conference, a Muslim conference in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And he was in a cab and if any, in New York. And if anybody knows anything about New York cab drivers or either the conduct of trying to rip people off or some of the people in New York City, not the Muslims, but some of the people in New York City, you can understand how this unfolded. Al Fahim had just gone around the corner from the masjid that he was leaving on his way to the airport. And uh, as the cab turned the corner, a car threw on brakes for some reason, and the cab just barely touched the bumper of the car in front of it. So the cab driver jumped out. He was thinking it's no big deal. He looked at the person's car he had hit from behind. The guy got out the car. He said, it's no big deal. You, know, you can't see any damage. So the car that had been hit from behind sped off. Al Fahim was in the back seat of the cab. And all of these New York cabs have these petitions separating the uh, backseat passenger from the driver so they won't get robbed. And it was a wire kind of mesh and plexiglass. And you pay by putting your money in a little tray and, and you uh, get out, pay for your cab and get out. So when the cab driver, and how, what the cab driver said was that when he had the accident and he went and looked in the back seat, Al Fahim was laying in the floor. And so he said his immediate response was, man, get up. You nothing, know there's nothing wrong with you. You're going to just try to get some money from the cab company. Get up out of that floor. But then after a few seconds, he realized Al Fahim <coughs> was not moving. And so he turned him over. And he said the only thing he could see on him was just a a, a really small, almost microscopic bump, not, uh, that was starting on his forehead. So he Im immediately called uh, the ambulance. They came, they took him, he was dead on arrival. And so without having autopsies and cutting his body all up, everyone realized, and, and another really interesting thing about him as well, he was traveling to this conference. He was gonna be there all weekend. And he was traveling with about $7 in his pocket. I mean, he had, uh, except for his cab fare. He had the money. He wasn't going to jump out and run into the airport. He had the money to pay for his cab. But after the cab fare, he had $7 in his pocket. And so I mentioned this story because we never know in what state Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take us. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made it clear that that last act that we're doing in this world is a kind of mirror of what our future state is going to be. So if I'm doing something bad and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes my soul, I'm in trouble. If I'm doing something good, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes my soul, then I stand a much better chance. But for Al Fahim, what everybody knew about him, and when they had his Janazah prayers. It, there were so many people that filled the ranks for his Salah that the prayers had to be held in a, actually outside. They were held outside because there was just that many people who were there to pray 
for the soul of our brother Al Fahim Job. But this was a consciousness that Allah knows best, that I believe and so many other thousands of people believe that here was a brother living in the shade of the Quran, living in the warmth of Iman, that Allah was blessing him on his last worldly act. He was going as a da'i to talk about and spread this religion in a state that was a number of states uh, away. He's somebody who wouldn't accept money. I don't care if he didn't have a penny in his pocket. He would not accept money from almost anybody, from anything he was doing. Just a wonderful, wonderful individual. But only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether those deeds that he performed will be accepted. But Allah commands us to just work. So Allah will see, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will see, and the believers will see our work. So we can only testify about each and every one of you. All we can see about each other is what we're doing and what we think are good deeds or what we can identify as bad deeds. Ultimately, it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's also a condition. The more we live in the warmth of this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be conscious about the deeds that we perform, no matter how small, no matter how big that we think they are. And I want to end on this particular note. And this is the note <coughs> that <coughs> when you look at the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you see that different brothers and sisters were gifted with certain abilities and certain capacities that others were not gifted and may not have that capacity uh, as this sister may have or that brother may have. But each one of them, to the best of their ability, in the context of performing good deeds, whatever it is that they could do, they put it at the service of the Islamic movement, under the service of the Islamic work, under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu No matter what you and I can do, no matter what we have to offer this ummah, no matter how insignificant we think that we may be as individuals and the capacity that we have could be so insignificant in our own eyes. But whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and I, we must put it at the service, put it at the disposal of this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there's this hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated that <coughs> uh, when asked, who are the best group of Muslims? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Sahaba, that my companions, there won't be another generation like that generation. They are the best. And then the question, well, who's next? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, well, there will be a, a generation called the Tabi'een, who will be companions of my companions. And well, who's next? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, well, then there will be the Taba Tabi'een, who will be companions of the companions. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in this narration and in another narration made it clear, but there will come a generation after these three generations of believers who will be more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course the Sahaba, I mean you're talking about close Sahaba sitting, listening to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu talk about there's going to come a generation in the future who's going to love me and love Allah more than you do. And so they want to understand that we've done everything. We put everything we've had at the disposal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you. So how could this be? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa simply explained it's because there will come a generation after them who have never laid eyes on me. They've never seen me. They've never heard the sound of my voice. 
They've never gotten direct and specific instructions from me to do this thing or to that thing. And yet their sacrifices will be so tremendous that their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be so great that the deeds that they perform will be so tremendous based on this deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love them so much and he will elevate them past you simply because they lived at a time when they never even saw me. They didn't hear me. They didn't see me. They didn't get instructions from me and this kind of thing. Brothers and sisters, you and I can be a part of that generation. Every single day that we focus our work on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that we do, our attachment to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and trying to keep that in mind in everything that we do, then this is a way that we can be elevated in a way. I'm not talking matching deed for deed and call the name of his sahaba and say, yeah, my deeds are better than his or her deeds because they won't be. But the simple fact that brothers and sisters can exceed in these good deeds, can avoid, consciously avoid these bad deeds, that we can make sacrifices for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never have ever having the opportunity. I'm not talking about going to Masjid al-Nabi and looking at the gate where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is buried in the, down behind that gate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about seeing the living Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not at Kiyama. So I'm going to end uh, at this particular point.